the death of utopia. Modern politics is a chapter in the history of religion. The greatest of the revolutionary upheavals that have shaped so much of the history of the past two centuries were episodes in the history of faith. Moments in the long dissolution of Christianity and the rise of modern political religion. The world in which we find ourselves at the start of the new millennium is littered with the debris of utopian projects, which though they were framed in secular terms that denied the truth of religion, were in fact vehicles for religious myths. Communism and Nazism claimed to be based on science. In the case of communism, the cod science of historical materialism. In Nazism, scientific racism. These claims were fraudulent, but the use of pseudoscience did not stop with the collapse of totalitarianism that culminated with the dissolution of the USSR in December 1991. It continued in neoconservative theories that claim the world is converging on a single type of government and economic system, universal democracy, or a global free market. Despite the fact that it was presented in the trappings of social science, this belief that humanity was on the brink of a new era was only the most recent version of apocalyptic beliefs that go back to the most ancient times. Jesus and his followers believed they lived in an end time when the evils of the world were about to pass away. Sickness and death, famine and hunger, war and oppression would all cease to exist after a world-shaking battle in which the forces of evil would be utterly destroyed. Such was the faith that inspired the first Christians, and though the end time was reinterpreted by later Christian thinkers as a metaphor for a spiritual change, visions of apocalypse have haunted Western life ever since those early beginnings. During the Middle Ages, Europe was shaken by mass movements inspired by the belief that history was about to end and a new world be born. These medieval Christians believed that only God could bring about the new world, but faith in the end time did not wither away when Christianity began to decline. On the contrary, as Christianity waned, the hope of an imminent end time became stronger and more militant. Modern revolutionaries, such as the French Jacobins and the Russian Bolsheviks, detested traditional religion, but their conviction that the crimes and follies of the past could be left behind in an all-encompassing transformation of human life was a secular reincarnation of early Christian beliefs. These modern revolutionaries were radical exponents of Enlightenment thinking, which aimed to replace religion with a scientific view of the world. Yet the radical Enlightenment belief that there can be a sudden break in history after which the flaws of human society will be forever abolished is a byproduct of Christianity. The Enlightenment ideologies of the past centuries were very largely spilt theology. The history of the past century is not a tale of secular advance, as beyond Ponson of right and left like to think. The Bolshevik and Nazi seizures of power were faith-based upheavals, just as much as the Ayatollah Khomeini's theocratic insurrection in Iran. The very idea of revolution as a transforming event in history is owed to religion. Modern revolutionary movements are a continuation of religion by other means. 
It is not only revolutionaries who have held to secular versions of religious beliefs, so too have liberal humanists who see progress as a slow, incremental struggle. The belief that the world is about to end and belief in gradual progress may seem to be opposites, one looking forward to the destruction of the world, the other to its improvement. But at bottom, they are not so different. Whether they stress piecemeal change or revolutionary transformation, theories of progress are not scientific hypotheses. They are myths which answer the human need for meaning. Since the French Revolution, a succession of utopian movements has transformed political life. Entire societies have been destroyed and the world changed forever. The alteration envisioned by utopian thinkers has not come about and for the most part their projects have produced results opposite to those they intended. This has not prevented similar projects being launched again and again right up to the start of the 21st century when the world's most powerful state launched a campaign to export democracy to the Middle East and throughout the world. Utopian projects reproduced religious myths that had inflamed mass movements of believers in the Middle Ages and they kindled a similar violence. The secular terror of modern times is a mutant version of the violence that has accompanied Christianity throughout its history. For over 200 years, the early Christian faith in an end time initiated by God was turned into a belief that utopia could be achieved by human action. Clothed in science, early Christian myths of apocalypse gave rise to a new kind of faith-based violence. When the project of universal democracy ended in the blood-soaked streets of Iraq, this pattern began to be reversed. Utopianism suffered a heavy blow, but politics and war have not ceased to be vehicles for myth. Instead, primitive versions of religion are replacing the secular faith that has been lost. Apocalyptic religion shapes the policies of American President George W. Bush and his antagonist Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in Iran. Wherever it is happening, the revival of religion is mixed up with political conflict, including an intensifying struggle over the Earth's shrinking reserves of natural resources. But there can be no doubt that religion is once again a power in its own right. With the death of Utopia, apocalyptic religion has re-emerged, naked and unadorned as a force in world politics. Apocalyptic Politics A new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, we read in Revelations. Cross out heaven, just keep the new earth, and you have the secret and the recipe of all utopian systems. E. M. Chiran. The religious roots of modern revolutionary movements were first systematically uncovered in Norman Cohn's seminal study the pursuit of the millennium. It has often been noted that for its followers, communism had many of the functions of a religion, a fact reflected in the title of a famous collection of essays by disillusioned ex-communists, The God That Failed, which was published not long after the start of the Cold War. Cohn showed the similarities went much further than had been realised. At its height, 20th century communism replicated many of the features of the millenarian movements that rocked Europe in late medieval times. Soviet communism was a modern millenarian revolution, and so 
Though the vision of the future that animated many Nazis was in some ways more negative, was Nazism. It may be worth clarifying some key terms. Sometimes called Chiliasts, a Chiliad is anything containing a thousand parts, and Christian millenarians believe Jesus will return to the earth and rule over it in a new kingdom for a thousand years. Millenarians hold to an apocalyptic view of history. In common speech, apocalyptic denotes a catastrophic event, but in biblical terms it derives from the Greek for unveiling. An apocalypse is a revelation in which mysteries that are written in heaven are revealed at the end of time, and for the elect this means not catastrophe, but salvation. Eschatology is the doctrine of last things and the end of the world. In Greek, eschatos means last or farthest. As I have already indicated, early Christianity was an eschatological cult. Jesus and his first disciples believed that the world was destined for imminent destruction so that a new and perfect one could come into being. Eschatology does not always have this positive character. In some pagan traditions, the end of the world is seen as meaning the death of the gods and the final disaster. Despite the fact that the Nazis adopted a Christian demonology, negative eschatology of this kind was a strand in their ideology. However, it was a positive version of apocalyptic belief that fueled medieval and secular millenarian movements which expected an end time when the evils of the world would disappear forever. Millenarianism is sometimes distinguished from millennialism, with the former believing in the literal return of Christ and the latter looking forward to the arrival of some kind of holy kingdom but there is no consistent pattern in the use of these terms, and except where otherwise indicated, I will use them interchangeably. In the forms in which it has affected Western societies, millenarianism is a Christian inheritance. Most religions lack any concept of history as a story with a beginning and an end. Hindus and Buddhists view human life as a moment in a cosmic cycle. Salvation means release from this unending ground. Plato and his disciples in pre-Christian Europe viewed human life in much the same way. Ancient Judaism contained nothing resembling the idea that the world was about to come to an end. Christianity injected the belief that human history is a teleological process. The Greek word telos means end, a word that in English means both the terminus of a process and the goal or purpose that a process can serve. In thinking of history in teleological terms, Christians believed it had an end in both senses. History had a predetermined purpose. And when it was achieved, it would come to a close. Secular thinkers such as Marx and Fukuyama inherited this teleology which underpins their talk of the end of history. In that they view history as a movement, not necessarily inevitable, but in the direction of a universal goal, theories of progress also rely on a teleological view. Standing behind all these conceptions is the belief that history must be understood not in terms of the causes of events, but in terms of its purpose, which is the salvation of humanity. This idea entered Western thought only with Christianity, and has shaped it ever since. Millenarian movements may not be confined to the Christian West. In 1853, Hong Jiquang, the leader of a movement called the Taiping Heavenly Army, who believed himself to be the younger brother of Jesus, founded a utopian community 
in Nanjing that lasted until it was destroyed 11 years later after a conflict in which over 20 million people died. The Taiping Rebellion is one of a number of Chinese uprisings moved by millenarian ideas. And while Christian missionaries may have brought these ideas to China, it may be the case that ideas of a similar kind were already present. Beliefs concerning an age of destruction followed by an era of peace guided by a celestial saviour may have existed in the country from the 3rd century onwards. Whether or not they are uniquely Western in origin, beliefs of this kind have had a formative influence on Western life. Medieval Kiliasm reflected beliefs that can be traced back to the beginnings of Christianity. Modern political religions, such as Jacobinism, Bolshevism and Nazism, reproduced millenarian beliefs in the terms of science. If a simple definition of Western civilization could be formulated, it would have to be framed in terms of the central role of millenarian thinking. Millenarian beliefs are one thing, millenarian movements another, and millenarian regimes something else again. Millenarian movements develop only in definite historical circumstances. Sometimes these are conditions of large-scale social dislocation, as in Tsarist Russia and Weimar Germany after the First World War. Sometimes as a single traumatic event as happened in the US with 9-11. Movements of this kind are often linked with disasters. Millenarian beliefs are symptoms of a type of cognitive dissonance in which normal links between perception and reality have been broken down. In Russia and Germany, war and economic collapse produced full-fledged millenarian regimes, while in America an unprecedented terrorist attack produced a millenarian outbreak that included an unnecessary war and a shift in the constitution. When and how millenarian beliefs become deciding forces in politics depends on the accidents of history. Apocalyptic beliefs go back to the origins of Christianity and beyond. The recurrent appearance of these beliefs throughout the history of Christianity is not an incursion from outside the faith. It is a sign of something that was present from the start. The teaching of Jesus was grounded in the belief that humanity was in its final days. Eschatology was central to the movement he inspired. In this respect, Jesus belonged in a Jewish apocalyptic tradition, but the radically dualistic view of the world that goes with apocalyptic beliefs is nowhere found in biblical Judaism. The central role of eschatology in the teaching of Jesus reflects the influence of other traditions. Contemporary historical scholarship has shown beyond reasonable doubt that Jesus belonged in a heterodox current of charismatic Judaism. The term Christian that came to be applied to Jesus' followers comes from the Greek word Christos, or the Anointed One, which is also the meaning of Messiah in Hebrew and Aramaic. The term Messiah is rarely found in the Hebrew Bible and when it appears, it is a title given to the king or a high priest. With the development of Christianity as a universal religion from the time of Paul onwards, the Messiah came to mean a divine figure sent by God to redeem all of humanity. Originally a message directed only to other Jews, the teaching of Jesus was that the old world was about to come to an end and a new kingdom established. There would be unlimited abundance in the fruits of the earth. Those who dwell in the new kingdom, including the righteous dead, who will be raised back to life, 
would be rid of physical and mental ills. Living in a new world that is without corruption, they will be immortal. Jesus was sent to announce this new kingdom and rule over it. There is much that is original and striking in Jesus' ethical teaching. He not only defended the weak and powerless as other Jewish prophets had done, but he also opened his arms to the outcasts of the world. Yet the belief that a new kingdom was at hand was the heart of his message and was accepted as such by his disciples. The new kingdom did not arrive, and Jesus was arrested and executed by the Romans. The history of Christianity is a series of attempts to cope with this founding experience of eschatological disappointment. Albert Schweitzer captured this predicament when he wrote, In the knowledge that he is the coming Son of Man, Jesus lays hold of the wheel of the world to set it moving on that last revolution that is to bring all ordinary history to a close. It refuses to turn and he throws himself upon it. When it does turn, it crushes him. Instead of bringing the eschatological condition, that is, the condition of perfect faithfulness and the absence of guilt, he has destroyed these conditions. In fact, eschatological hope was not destroyed. Among his followers in the early church, the belief sprang up that Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. It was not long before an attempt was made to interpret Jesus' teaching of the end of the world as a metaphor for an inner change. Already in St. Paul, there is the hint that the kingdom of heaven is an allegory of a spiritual change. It was Paul, a Hellenized Jew also called Saul of Tarsus, who more than anyone else turned the Jesus movement from a dissident Jewish sect into a universal religion. Paul shared the expectation of Jesus' original disciples that the world was about to come to an end, but he opened the way for a view of the end that applied to all humankind. A more systematic attempt to diffuse the eschatological hopes that animated Jesus and his disciples was made by St. Augustine, AD 354-430. Augustine began as a follower of the Manichaean religion, which viewed evil as a permanent feature of the world, and his theology showed marked traces of this view. Whereas Mani believed the war between light and dark would go on forever, the followers of Jesus looked forward to an end time in which evil would be permanently destroyed. Augustine believed that human beings were ineradicably flawed, and this doctrine of original sin became the cardinal tenet of Christian orthodoxy, yet it may owe more to Mani than to Jesus. Another major influence on Augustine's reformation of Christian belief was Platonism. Much impressed by Plato's idea that spiritual things belong in an eternal realm, Augustine suggested that the end of time should be understood in spiritual terms, not as an event that will happen at some point in the future, but as an inner transformation that can happen at any time. At the same time, Augustine introduced into Christianity a categorical distinction between the city of man and the city of God. Because human life is marked by original sin, the two cities can never be one. Evil has been at work in every human heart since the fall of man. It cannot be defeated in this world. This doctrine gave Christianity an anti-utopian bent it never completely lost, and Christians were spurred the disillusionment that comes to all who expect any basic change in human affairs. In Augustinian terms, the belief that evil can be destroyed, which inspired medieval millenarians and resurfaced in the Bush administration, is highly unorthodox. Yet some such belief was a central feature of the apocalyptic cult to which the followers of Jesus belonged.
The outbursts of Kiliasm that recur throughout Western history are heretical reversions to Christian origins. By deliteralizing the hope of the end, Augustine preserved eschatology while reducing its risks. The kingdom of God existed in a realm out of time, and the inner transformation it symbolized could be realized at any point in history. With the denunciation of millennialism by the Council of Ephesus in 431, the Church adopted this Augustinian view, but that did not stop the eruption of Kiliastic movements that harked back to the beliefs that inspired Jesus. Nor did it end the role of Kiliasm in the Church itself. In the 12th century, Joachim of Flora reversed Augustine's theology. Believing that he had gleaned an esoteric meaning from the scriptures, Joachim, a Cistercian abbot who had travelled in the Holy Land where he experienced some kind of spiritual illumination, turned the Christian doctrine of the Trinity into a philosophy of history in which humanity ascended through three stages. From the age of the Father, via the age of the Son, it would move to the age of the Spirit, a time of universal brotherhood that would continue until the last judgment. Each of these ages had a leader, with Abraham at the head of the first and Jesus the second. A new and final leader who embodied the third person of the Divine Trinity would inaugurate the Third Age, which Joachim expected to arrive in 1260. Joachim's Trinitarian philosophy of history reinfused medieval Christianity with eschatological fervour, and versions of his three-phase scheme reappear in many later Christian thinkers. Taken up by a radical wing of the Franciscan order, Joachite prophecy inspired millenarian movements in southern Europe. In Germany, it helped create a messianic cult around Emperor Friedrich II, who, after conquering the city in a crusade, crowned himself King of Jerusalem and was denounced by Pope Gregory IX as the Antichrist. The division of human history into three ages had a profound impact on secular thought. Hegel's view of the evolution of human freedom in three dialectical stages, Marx's theory of the movements from primitive communism through class society to global communism, Auguste Comte's positivist vision of humankind's evolution from religious to metaphysical and scientific stages of development, all reproduce the three-part scheme. The common division of history into three phases, ancient, medieval and modern, echoes the Joachite scheme. Even more strikingly, as will be seen in the next chapter, it was Joachim's prophecy of a third age that gave the Nazi state the name of the Third Reich. Concepts such as ancient and modern have become indispensable terms of art, and I will use them even as I criticise the scheme of thought they express. In secular versions of the Apocalypse, the New Age comes about through human action. For Jesus and his disciples, the New Kingdom could come about only through the will of God, but God's will was resisted by the power of evil, which they personified as Belial or Satan. In this view of things, the world is divided into good and evil forces. There is even a suggestion that humanity may be ruled by a diabolical power. Nothing like this can be found in the Hebrew Bible. Satan appears in the book of Job, but as an emissary of Yahweh, not as a personification of evil. A view of the world as a battleground between good and evil forces developed only later in Jewish apocalyptic traditions. There are many similarities between the Zoroastrian religion of Zervanism 
and Jewish apocalyptic beliefs of the kind recorded in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Jewish apocalyptic thought most likely reflects the influence of Zoroastrianism. It seems to have been Zoroaster, an Iranian prophet, also known as Zarathustra, who lived some time between 1500 and 1200 BC, who first conceived of human life as a battle between light and darkness that could end in a victory for light. Zoroastrianism is one of the most peaceful religions in history. Nevertheless, through his formative influence on Judaism, Christianity and Islam, Zoroaster may be the ultimate source of the faith-based violence that has broken out again and again throughout Western history. Many traditions have seen human life as a war between good and evil, but they have taken for granted that the conflict will go on forever. An unending alternation of light and dark is found in Egyptian myth. Some have expected the struggle to end in darkness. The 8th century BC Greek poet Hesiod pictured human history as a process of decline from a primordial golden age to an age of iron in which humanity would be destroyed. If there is anything resembling a perfect society, it is located in the past. It was never envisioned that the cosmic struggle could end in a victory for light. Even Zoroaster may not have believed its triumph was preordained. Rather than announcing the end of the world, Zoroastrian texts call followers of the Prophet to a struggle whose outcome remains in doubt. Even so, the belief that good could triumph was a new development in a human thought, and as far as we can tell it came from Zoroaster. This dualistic view of the world was inherited by the religion of Mani, the later Iranian prophet born around AD 216 in Babylonia and martyred as a heretic by the Zoroastrian authorities in 277, whose teaching had such a deep influence on Augustine. Mani differed from Zoroaster in believing that a duality of light and dark is a permanent feature of the world. Manichaeism spread as far as China, adopting some of the imagery and symbolism of Buddhism in the process. Throughout these transformations, the Manichees retained their belief that evil could never be eradicated. On this point, the religion of Mani differs radically from Zoroastrianism and from the teachings of Jesus. Manichaean dualism entered into Gnosticism, which despite being persecuted by Christianity, reappeared in many different guises right up to modern times. Gnosticism is a tradition of forbidding complexity, but its central vision of a dark world governed by demonic forces had a profound impact on the history of religion. In the first two or three centuries after the death of Jesus, there was a Gnostic current within Christianity, distinguished from others by its assertion that only those who shared in the secret teachings passed on by Jesus could be saved. The term Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge, and in the turbulent world of early Christianity, when nearly every aspect of Christian belief was intensely contested, Gnostics embodied the belief that salvation comes to those, perhaps only a few, who possess a type of esoteric spiritual insight and consists not in physical immortality in this world, but in liberation from the human body and the material world. Though this set of beliefs had little in common with those of Jesus and was condemned by the early church, it remained a strand in Christianity. Too little remains of their texts to be certain, but a type of Gnosticism seems to have resurfaced among the Cathars, who flourished in the 12th century France until Pope Innocent III launched a crusade against them, and, after a 40-year war in which around half a million people were killed, 
nearly erased them from history. However, Gnosticism was not destroyed. It survived and reinvented itself, appearing in many unexpected guises, including, according to Hans Jonas, author of a masterly study of Gnostic traditions, the philosophy of Martin Heidegger. Yet it was not Gnosticism that re-emerged in the repeated outbreaks of millenarianism that occurred through the history of Christianity. It was the belief in a cosmic war between good and evil, a belief that had animated Jesus and his disciples and which echoed the dualistic worldview of Zoroaster. Through its formative influence on Western monotheism, of which Islam and modern political religions are integral parts, Zoroaster's view of the world shaped much of Western thought and politics. When Nietzsche declared that good and evil are an invention of Zarathustra, he may have been exaggerating, but he was not entirely wrong. Christianity injected eschatology into the heart of Western civilization, and despite Augustine, it has reappeared time and again. Between the 11th and 16th centuries, movements inspired by the millenarian beliefs developed in England and Bohemia, France and Italy, Germany and Spain, and many other parts of Europe. Whether the people they attracted were affected by war, plague or economic hardship, these movements thrived among groups who found themselves in a society they could no longer recognise or identify with. The most extraordinary was the Brethren of the Free Spirit, a network of adepts and disciples that extended across large areas of Europe for several centuries. The Free Spirit may not have been only a Christian heresy. The Beghards, or Holy Beggars, as followers of the Free Spirit were sometimes known, wore robes similar to those of Sufis, who preached similar heterodox beliefs in 12th century Spain and elsewhere and the free spirit may also have imbibed inspiration from surviving Gnostic traditions, which were never only Christian. In any event, before they were anything else, Christian or Muslim, the brethren of the free spirit were mystics who believed they had access to a type of experience beyond ordinary understanding. This illumination was not, as the church believed, a rare episode in the life of the believer granted by God as an act of grace. Those who had known this state became incapable of sin and could no longer be distinguished, in their own eyes, from God. Released from the moral ties that restrain ordinary humanity, they could do as they willed. 